um, we will be getting started in just a few minutes. Uh, we'll be recording this event as you just saw the record button um, was just turned on. I'm Ann Massoni and on behalf of the Society for Photographic Education who is hosting this event, welcome. SPE is a member-based organization for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, I'll be dropping our website in the chat window momentarily. A few protocol reminders. As an attendance taking mechanism, please put your name and email address in the chat window so that we can share with you any updates directly in addition to social media posts. We've started you all out on mute so that the presenters can begin our meeting and we'll open that up to the larger audience once we've completed the presentation. So please do stay in mute until then. Once we wrap up presentations, we'll stick around and have an informal conversation. We ask that you present your questions in the chat feature so that we can help facilitate the conversation um, and we'll let you know when it's time for that to occur. Um, we've been trying a couple of different chat options. Um, right now the chat is open to everybody um, uh, and we'll, uh, we appreciate any feedback you have on the different um, styles that we've been using over the last couple of weeks. And as I say, every week we are establishing the way to move forward in this shifting time and we can do this together. So first to Betsy. Hi, so I have two things and I'll try to be quick because I know we're all excited to hear John and John and Mike talk. Um, but the first thing I want to talk about is, is we're, first of all, we shifted up the order today a little bit. We're gonna get, do some business and then, and then we'll have the speaker and then we'll have the Q and A um, after. So first thing I was gonna, I wanted to talk a little bit about, we're just thinking about Photofica and what Photofica is and, and what, what we see maybe happening going forward. And I think right now is it's the end of the semester um, maybe some of the more immediate needs that we were trying to serve are going to shift a little bit. So one thought that we're having is, is um, having some longer, more intensive workshops uh, throughout the summer, and we're developing ideas for that. And if, if you want to send me or us any ideas, that would be great, um, like practical, practical ideas about dealing with the fall and dealing with you know, teaching online, teaching hybrid, um, which leads me to my next thing. But, but so just, just know that that's kind of an evolution, what's, what's, what's happening and what we're thinking about here. And then I just have a little thing. I'm, oh, I know, sorry. <laughs> and, and we're gonna focus a lot on our, on our page right now and consolidating um, resources and focusing on, on blogging a little bit more. Uh, and what I just said earlier too about about uh, even uh, what all the thesis shows that are going on or or student initiatives, faculty initiatives for recognizing students. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna work a little bit more towards being a, a place with with consolidation, which was a lot of our original ideas. Now I have a little thing that I need to I need to say because I've been thinking a lot after last week about the idea of self care and um, about us as artists. And I think, um, I wrote this big longer blog that I'll post, and I'm not gonna go into it, thinking about this, you know, the, the old cliche, right? About uh, those who can't do teach and why that like, that is a kind of a, it's very problematic, but it's also, I feel like it's sometimes kind of provocative when I'm feeling like I'm more of a teacher than an artist and I, th I personally believe the two are, are integrated, but I do think maybe one really, a message that I wanna give people right now is paying attention to your, your artist self, especially now that we're going into the summer. Um, and so I wrote this little thing that I'm just gonna read really quick and then, um, so, you know, making art matters, creative output matters. And I, I don't mean shows or books or self-promotion um, I mean, those focused, beautiful moments in the studio, the dark room, taking pictures, editing, printing, the moments where time disappears, when the best possible day is a day when you wake up and you know where to start and you just spend the whole day in the studio and, you know, again, time disappears. And I believe for many of us, this is where we should try to spend as much of the summer as possible in that space. I'm trying to get myself there right now, but I'm... I'm having a really hard time making art about now. Um, and I think we've all seen like 
shows and, and publications and spreads in the New York Times about people responding to now. Um, I'm finding the time of COVID, it, you know, the, that the normal knowing, not knowing space that, that really is great for art is, is, is upside down. It's not fueling art for me. I don't know what I think or feel about now um, and not enough to make pictures or art about it. Um, I feel abandoned a little bit by my creativity. Um, I've been putting up old work. I've been honoring the class of 2020. And for the last two weeks, I, I've spent my time making video montages for my daughter's rowing team. Um, and I labored over those and they were pictures put to music, sentimental of the moment for the moment, meant to elicit feelings of nostalgia and longing, uh, not art. Um, and I, I, but it was really liberating. Like it was really kind of a great thing to do. So I guess I just want to, I want to come back to that is that, that um, creating without, without judging yourself too hardly, harshly. Um, anyway, so for me, I just wanted to say that making those montages felt really good um, and taking a little bit ju of judgment away from myself and letting myself just create, not even create, just, I don't know. Yeah, create. Anyway, that's my little words of wisdom for the day. I'm going to step back and hand it over to John right now. I think well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the first thing that actually yeah, then we'll do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Excellent. Thank you, Betsy. All right. So um, it is a great pleasure to introduce Mike Mandel to those of you guys who are new to him and his work. Um, a renowned photographer and maker of the baseball photographer trading cards which Photofica has based its all-star uh, all trading cards on. And while his accolades are far too many to list here, um, solo shows, incredible locations, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, et cetera, um, his work in numerous collections, I thought instead I would share with you all an email that we received from Ann Tucker when she agreed to participate as a contributor to our all-star cards. Um, all right, so this is her email. Glad to help in any way, I'm still around. I remember Mike appearing at my door in Philadelphia and asking to photograph me for baseball cards. It was night. The picture was taken in the backyard with a flash. He gave me the hat and glove. I knew nothing about baseball at the time, now I'm a fan. But then I didn't know enough to be as witty as Nathan Lyons or John Sarkowski in the Verso text. They and several others realized that how, how they looked in the pictures was not as important as what they wrote. Beaumont was as clueless as I was. A couple of years later, I was the curator of photography at the Museum of Fine Art Houston and had purchased a complete set of the cards for the museum. The cards were the most contemporary object in the show that opened in 1976. Contemporary in every way, Ann Tucker. So, Mike, we are thrilled to have you. Very sweet. Yeah, right? Lovely, lovely sentiment. And uh, so I think the plan today is for us to just have a little bit of Q&A. And um, let's see if I can stand back here. I'm, I'm going to have to change outfits <laughs> to properly deal with this conversation with Mike Mandel. <laughs> This is good food from Toledo, Ohio. Um, I don't know if they're still around, but uh, they're officially sponsoring. Uh, I don't know what they're, they're not sponsoring anything. And then. Uh, all right. All right. Here we computer. go. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's play ball here. So Mike, I am really excited to talk to you uh, despite my, uh, ooh, let's see here. I'm going to get organized here. I feel like I'm a coach. I feel like I'm a baseball coach here. Yeah, what's, what's the F for? What's the F stand for? You know, the F, uh, I think it's for, it might be for Fordham. I don't know what it is. It's a hat that I liked. It's purple, which is the color I love. Uh, my last name is Fryer, so I, I bought it. That's what they're but doing. I think it's for Photo Fika. So, you know, everything, <laughs> everything becomes something else. Um, well, you know, we're, we're really going to be, I, I guess we're going to, I feel like it's, it's, it's like, uh, I feel bad about talking to you about the baseball cards because like 
it's something you made so long ago, but it's something that that really resonates with people, and and as evidenced by the, the by the participants in this in this project, uh, you know, I'm uh, uh, Betsy and I are the ones that are running the 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 social media part of this in terms of the uh, the Instagram, and I I can't tell you how excited the students are to get their stuff on the site immediately. And then they're posting things to art to, to, to social media before I can download them and print them, you know, all the things that they know how to do. So, um, so there's excitement around it. And, and, and you know, in, in thinking about your project, I wanted to ask you if you, were, were you still a student when, when the project started? Yeah, I, uh, I was a grad student at uh, San Francisco Art Institute. Um, you know, actually, I've got all this stuff on a PowerPoint. If you want to see that stuff, I've got it on screen. If or I could just talk, whichever you like. You know what? If you want to, uh, yeah, you can. You, we should be able. Should we? Anne, are we able to enable him to share a screen? That'd be fantastic. Yeah, well, let's see. Let's see if it works. Yeah. Here. If it works, great. And if not, we can talk. Uh, here we go. All right. So you're looking at um, a Newsweek. Uh, cover in 1974. I was a grad student in 74. And apparently Newsweek figured out that uh, photography was something that was um, worthwhile to talk about. They had a 17 page uh, spread about contemporary photography. And this to me was kind of uh, symbolizes what was happening at that moment in photography. And that is that uh, it was being discovered. Photographers were no longer just part of a small community of people that like to connect with each other through organizations like the SBE, but uh, we're now people that could uh, show their work in galleries, make some money at it. I love that this page here has Robert Frank and Les Crims right next to each other, which would never ever <laughs> happen. And Imogen Cunningham is the queen. Um, and here that Ansel Adams photograph is somehow falling under the category of the documentary is also really quite nice. But anyway, this, this was a moment in time when I recognized that um, photography was going to become something else. And all the people that I could easily connect with, people like Robert Heineken, because uh, I was living in Los Angeles, uh, even though I wasn't a student of his, I could call him up and go visit him, or I could talk to him at a photo opening, or uh, you know, all these people that I cared about were just really easy to get access to, and that I recognized that all this was going to change uh, once they became art stars. So. That's why I, uh, I started to, to think about how could I make a satire about that? And I came up with this idea of photographing uh, people as uh, photographers as baseball cards. And I had, become, I had been a big baseball card collector as a kid, so it didn't come out of nowhere. It was really part of my childhood. And the idea of collecting a baseball card was somehow about uh, being able to see what that person looked like, you know, when you were watching uh, or when you were listening to a baseball game, in those days it was on the radio, uh, you didn't even know what the, the players looked like. So to collect the cards kind of made them more real and uh, also made them more public. So it was, uh, you know, you kind of connected with them in a, in a public way. So I thought about the idea of making the uh, photographers more public part of a, a vernacular of the trading card uh, form. And uh, I went across the US and I visited, the first person I started with was Imogen. And, uh, you know, she wanted to actually pose in a Mao cap, which she is, but uh, I had hoped to try to convince her to do the, you know, do it with a Cincinnati Reds cap, but that, that wouldn't go. <laughs> so I taught her how to pitch, and she's actually got a pretty good motion here. This is a really nice portrait of how one might pitch uh, a right-handed uh, curveball. She says she apparently does not know if to quit 1901. Well, 1901 is when she started photographing. She was born in 1883. So she was 91 when I made her photograph. And you can see all the stuff here, the, uh, the height, weight, where she was you know, born, throws uh, left or right. Uh, these you know, all typical kinds of data that would, that would be on a baseball card. So I wanted all that kind of uh, information that defined someone statistically to be part of the card. So I had all these uh, photo categories like FC, favorite camera, favorite developer, favorite paper, favorite film, favorite photographer. And then I left a space where people could write whatever they wanted to. So- How, how old were you when you did this? Hmm. 
1974, I was uh, 23. And was and, this- uh, was The cards this were published in 75. So it was about a, almost two years actually that it took me to put this whole thing together. I traveled across the US on a trip um, that went, you know, uh, kind of the northern part of the states up to New York and then down to Florida and then across the south. And, uh, you know, I had with me my SPE directory so that um, when we get to a certain part of the world where uh, there was a photographer that lived there, I could call them up and see if they would let us sleep on their couch. I was uh, driving with my, uh, my girlfriend at the time. And uh, I think in f four months, we only, we only had to pay for a motel four times. <laughs> so we, we did appreciate the, uh, the community of photographers that were kind of supporting us as we, as we went along. So I'm kind of showing you some of the portraits that I made uh, and it just happened to be that people were home when I was in their neighborhood. Some people weren't home, so if some photographers are missing, it's mostly because of the fact they just weren't there. Uh, but you know, some people, there were a couple people that wouldn't wouldn't do it. I really wanted to get Walker Evans. I, I was there in the room with Walker Evans, and I can, tried to give him my most convincing argument that he should be able to make fun of himself, but he just wouldn't do it. <laughs> Actually, sadly, he died about three weeks after I, I visited him. So this was really my a last chance. Now, um, I, I read somewhere that uh, that you had to reshoot a bunch of these. Well, I had to reshoot the Ansel Adams card because okay. um, let's see if I've got Ansel Adams here. Yeah. Uh, when I went to visit Ansel, you know, actually even, well, you know, first I photographed Imogen. So once I got Imogen to do it, oh, then yeah. uh, she was my entree, basically. I got her to call up Ansel for me and yeah. he said, you know, through her that it would be okay. So then I called him up and he said, uh, sure, come on over. Next opportunity is in about two months. You know, he was booked up for two months. So I, I only lived about 40 miles away. So it was no big deal. I show up at Ansel's house. Uh, it was foggy out. I figured I'd use a fill flash in my, uh, I guess my nervousness. When I connected the flash, I connected it to the flash bulb synchronization instead of the X synchronization. So all my exposures were out of, were uh, underexposed. I call him up, you know, this is the guy that invented the zone system, right? So I call him up and he goes, uh, not a problem. I'll, we'll just do it, you know, next time around, which was two more months. And I made sure that I did both uh, fill flash and uh, ambient light up at that time. But most of the, you know, I don't think I had to re-photograph anybody other than Ansel. I think I, I just, uh, I had it down pretty much. I, I knew, like when I visited Ann Tucker, you know, as you said, I got there at night. We set it up at night. I photographed her and I was on my way probably within an hour and <laughs> off to the next. Um, let's see, I was going to show you uh, the gum was part of it. Uh, you know, I guess I should say the cards were, you know, I had 134 different portraits that I made. There were 3,000 cards, so that means there were 400,000. 402,000 cards that I had and that I packaged them in groups of 10 at random. And I was kind of doing that slowly. The Topps uh, Chewing Gum Company had donated the gum and I had like these boxes of gum. And if you could imagine what gum smells like, you know, boxes of thousands of pieces of gum in my house. It was just <laughs> really quite something. Um, and the gum, you know, has, is still there in some of the original packs and it's kind of like if you touch the pack wrong and the, the gum just disintegrates into tiny pieces because it's, you know, 45 years old. But anyway, we started packaging them up and then I, once I got a bunch of publicity about the cards, the um, uh, Chronicle in San Francisco and uh, Sports Illustrated and f Popular Photography and Newsweek, they all did articles, all of a sudden everybody wanted the cards. So then I had to hire a bunch of kids, a bunch of high school kids, to package them in groups of 10. And uh, it was not an easy thing to do. It's like I had like the famous photographers in one grouping and I had the regional photographers in another grouping. And I said to the people who were packaging them, they're trying to get an equal number of each one. Uh, anyway, it all, it all worked out. And uh, there's the whole set of them here. This is the uh, the press sheets of the 134 photographers. I was kind of basing them on an idea I had of the 1958 cards, which uh, I can, think I can show you the 58 cards here. On the top of the, that was my first set that I what I collected when I was seven years old. And they were very graphic cards, or very simple. Uh, I, I love the just kind of simple uh, color backdrops. 
So, and a lot of the, the photographs are really dumb. You know, these kind of pictures that, well, I guess the one over here on the left, like Willard Schmidt, he, what is he doing? <laughs> He's just kind of looking up like, what the heck is going on here? I just love that kind of, yeah. the, kind of the dumbness of some of the portraits. So I'm showing you here, um, I've been able to exhibit the cards more recently. So I've had the opportunity to show them with the 58 cards and try to make a connection between like Larry here next to Stan Pallas, you know, they both look like they're, uh, they need something spiritual in their life to, to kind of make it all work. <laughs> so I was trying to find something that would connect with each one of the different cards. Uh, I guess, you know, I have just different uh, examples of the cards I can show you. Like, you know, again, the back of the card was an opportunity where each person could say something that was funny or just say something that they wanted to say that would be appropriate for the back of the card. When Minor White uh, wrote in his, it was, uh, you know, baseball is an amusing anecdote about beautiful women, which is an odd thing for him to say, but it's only because when I wrote a little uh, note about uh, how to do it, I said, you can write about anything you like. You could write an, an amusing anecdote or write about a beautiful woman. <laughs> and he just kind of turned it back and gave it to me uh, just in the sentence that I wrote to him. So anyway, that's, um, this again shows you like how they've been presented more recently. I'll get, I'll get out of the screen now and you can, uh, we can talk in person again. So let's see if I can remember how to do that. Stop share. Here we go. <laughs> and, and did you, um, what, did you go to every state? I mean, how many states did you go to? Oh, I, I have no idea, but I, I was, no idea. you know. Yeah. Did you go to Iowa? I think there was someone in John, Iowa. I can't remember John who it be now. Who was there in the 70s? I think John Schultz. Well, I, he's in the cards, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I went to Iowa uh, and, um, and worked there and taught there. And it's funny because, you know, one of the, the, the people that I show frequently in my classes is Charles Ray. There's, a, there's an image that, so Charles Ray was a, was a BFA student at, um, at Iowa in, in painting. And, and there are faculty there that to this day don't like him because he never did any of the work, right? He just, he would like, but he was doing the work. And there's, and there's, a, there's a piece that, that's of his that's in, uh, in the Met that's, that's a photograph of him being tied up into a tree. And it was probably taken by Schultz or like one of his students who was an M M MFA photographer. And it's a terrible photograph, right? It's just documentation, but it's, it's a really important moment. And it's something that he did as a, as a BFA student. So I like to talk about that with my students saying, you know, you, we need to take what you're doing and you need to take what you're doing really seriously. Because like Charles Ray at 20, like changed the conversation about the body in sculpture. And, and in the same way, like I, I think about the work that you were doing at that time at 23, like there's no predicting that it's gonna be one of the most significant works that you've done, right? Or not most significant works that you've done, but it is, it is a work that like you're known for, that you're continuing to exhibit. exhibit. It, 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 it is this chronicle of this particular moment of time in photography where photography had willed itself into existence. And then, and then um, you know, people like Charles Ray is not a photographer and, and has, a, has a photo in, in the Met. So at the exact time that you're looking at photographers that are, that are really becoming like the photographers they want to be and photography is becoming the thing, there, you know, other people are tearing that whole system down and, and using it and artists are using it in totally different ways. And, and I, I, I'm interested in the, in the road trip. Right. So at the same time you're doing this, Stephen Shore or a little bit later is on the road. Eleanor Anton is doing 100 boots. I mean, so what is it about the road trip and that lore? And obviously, uh, Frank, right, Robert Frank, like the road trip has been like a preeminent part of photography. So can you talk about your relationship to to the road <laughs> in, in, its, in its connection to to that history that's connected to photography? Yeah, well, I guess I haven't thought much about uh the road as a real significant um, metaphor, or uh, it's something that I've done, or I did quite a number of trips across country for various projects. I uh, actually, subsequent to this, back in the, back in 79, I did a book on the Giants, the San Francisco Giants, uh, which has absolutely nothing to do with art. 
other than the fact that it's really a good book. <laughs> it's a, a, an oral history of the San Francisco Giants, and I traveled in by car by myself. This was not with anybody. I was all by myself traveling all across the United States, up, you know, up to Rochester, New York, down to Florida again, flying to the Dominican Republic to interview the Giants that were from that, that country, and then I mean, the idea and going to like places like a prison where Orlando Cepeda was in prison for dealing marijuana. Um, I mean, it was a, a great adventure. I mean, even doing the, the baseball cards was the same kind of thing, because like I said, I had no idea if anybody would even be home when I was happy to get through, uh, you know, St. Louis or Rochester or whatever. Whoever was there, uh, I lucked out or I didn't luck out uh, or, you know, I got to Les Crims's house in Buffalo and it was late at night and I couldn't really call him up at 11 o'clock and we didn't really know, we didn't want to get a motel. So we, we found a gas station around the block from where he lived and asked the guys at the gas station if we could just sleep in the car <laughs> overnight uh, until the morning. And, you know, it was like winter and we were, uh, fortunately the car had seats. This is a Renault. I don't call it Renault. I call it a Renault because in California, that's what you call them. And the seats went all the way back. So you could actually sleep in the car. It was a tiny little car, but you could sleep in the car. So it was great, you know, to travel around the country. And you didn't really have to find a motel. You could, as long as you had a sleeping bag, you could just, you know, you could stay in the car and sleep overnight. So as far as answering your question from a conceptual standpoint about the uh, kind of the magic or the romance of being on the road, I haven't ever really put it into that context from a, you know, a really thoughtful way, other than the fact that I've just, I did it a lot in the, when I was in my 20s, when, when I could still contort my body into driving 500 miles a day. <laughs> so, so, so what, about the, what about the idea of, of you know, so we're, you know, uh, Betsy said the now, right? Like, like in terms of dealing with the, the circumstance of, circumstances of today, you were also, you know, dealing with the circumstances of that moment, right? And, and, and like, I guess, I guess, what do you think about the, the, what would you say to a student who's like waiting to do the thing? Yeah, I think what you said earlier about uh, Charles Ray uh, hits, hits home a little bit. I was, um, I was 19, uh, in 1970, I was an undergraduate at um, Cal State Northridge, which at that time was called Valley State. It's such a great name for a school is Valley State. <laughs> and were you doing a BFA or just a BA or an AA or? Uh, I was, I got a degree in, uh, in philosophy, uh, yeah. a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy. Because for our card system, anybody with an AA, BA, BS, BFA, MFA, it's a catch-all for just about anyone who's working in photography. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I did not consider myself uh, a student of art uh, I was going to be a lawyer. You know, I was on my way to somewhere else when the times just kind of intervened. You know, this was the era of uh, Vietnam and the counterculture. And, you know, it was just a great moment to be a teenager when all of a sudden you could kind of reframe and re-energize who your identity, what your identity was going to be. But what I was going to say was that, you know, so here I was a photo student. I was 19 and I was making pictures of uh, people in cars, uh, people making the right turns. Maybe some of you have seen the, the book that I recently published, uh, People in Cars. And I was really interested in having people respond to me while they were making their turns or someone was in the passenger seat. So I was using like a wide angle lens and I was getting really close to the car. And anyway, I had all these pictures that I was making for my intermediate photography course. And then uh, Ed Sievers, who was my teacher, said, uh, Robert Frank is going to come to class uh, next week. So I'd like to have all you guys put your pictures up. You know, Robert Frank wasn't coming to talk to the school. He wasn't, you know, it was like he was just coming to our class. <laughs> he was just going to give a critique to those of us that happened to be there in class. So we all put our stuff up and Robert looks at my pictures and he goes, you know, I've made some pictures like that and I, it's not that easy. And this is pretty good. And I thought like, well, thank you. <laughs> and it probably enabled me to make, you know, instead of 20 rolls of sh pictures, it made me take that project more seriously. And I made about 75 rolls of photographs of the uh, people in cars. And, and I really thought that was a great project. And I, and it still looks pretty good right now. So I guess I would say that is that uh, when you're young, 
you know, that's when you've got the most time and you've got the most focus is to put your energy into something that you really kind of fall in love with. Once you get out of school and you're, you know, you're in debt and you got to get a job and your time is really fragmented, especially these days, uh, it's almost, it's tough. It's much harder than it was, you know, when I was doing it 45 years ago when life was much quieter, there was less, um, less to do. We weren't on the phone all the time. We were, you know, we had a lot of free time. Our standard of living was really high, so you could live on nothing. It's not the way it is these days. So I guess when you've got that time and you've got that opportunity, uh, take yourself seriously and, uh, and just go for it, you know. And one, one other thing that I heard as you started, because we, we're, we're almost at time here, but we'll, if you can stick around for Q&A, that would be fantastic, was, um, was that you were working out of the SPE directory when it was a physical paper that you would get. Right. So, uh, you know, when was the last time, Anne, when was the last time we printed a directory? It's very good for a road trip. It's I think cool. I have one on my bookshelf back here, it's on my exactly. status bookshelf. I do remember receiving one, but, but it's been a while. All right. Well, uh, here's to the SPE bookshelf or uh, uh, membership directory. Uh, if you're not a member, now you'll have access to it if you become a member. And, and uh, I don't know if Mike's still a member, but you'll get his name and phone number if he is. <laughs> I don't think I've been a member for a while, but maybe I should be. I don't know. Well, you know, it's a, a membership organization, as they say. Yeah. No, it served me very well. I really enjoyed the SPE. I mean, it was these great moments when, uh, you know, I lived on the West Coast. I lived near San Francisco. Ansel Adams uh, gave a big talk in 1975 at the SPE conference at the Sillimar. And, uh, I, you know, there's things that really resonate with me that go right back to those moments of uh, going out and looking at uh, Brett Weston's little shed where he took out uh, pepper number 30 and, you know, held it up to the sun so he could see the negative. It was, you know, SPE was pretty uh, fabulous during those times for me anyway. I'm, you know, I'm talking from a, a generation now that's like 45, 50 years ago, but uh, yeah. I, I really enjoyed connecting with uh, every, I mean, that's what, it, that's what the baseball cards for me were about was that yeah. we were a community. It was really a low, uh, there was no, pretentiousness about it. We were just all doing what we wanted to do and we loved it. Yeah, and, there's, a, uh, there's a flattening that, that happens with those yeah. cards where, you know, John Schultz and Ansel Adams are, are in the same deck and, and, and we hope that the, that the, the project we're doing does that, right? That, that students from, from RISD, students from Yale, if they apply, uh, you know, are on the same lines as, as uh, you know, students from Monmouth University. So, yeah. Well, they look—they look fabulous. Uh, I Is love the. Uh, to be, are you? Yeah, you've—you've you've agreed to be a reviewer, right? You can yes. write 144 yes. characters. I'll be happy to do what, what I can. Okay, awesome. Well, I think we should open it up to questions, Anne. Unless or Betsy, do you have? Uh, yeah, I have a question. <laughs> Betsy has. Of course, like, I have a question. <laughs> but before you ask your question, if you do have a question, please do put it in the chat, um, and uh, and we'll go through them. Yeah, thanks. And maybe it's even, it's less of a, of a question or more of a comment, a, a thought that I have about this idea of, of, we were talking about taking things seriously, but also this idea of play um, and this idea of um, that, that, that things can, I, it just feels like this project came from the gut in a way. I mean, I think I love the baseball cards. I collected baseball cards as a kid too, and that there's something about that seems connected to photography for me about these little pictures that you collect when you're a kid and you own them, right? And you have them in a stack and you can sort them. Um, but this idea of, of high art too versus, you know, I won't say low art, but yeah, you know, and I, I think, I guess I would maybe like you to talk just a little bit about the idea of, of the playfulness of it and I mean, there's humor. There's a there's a little bit of a, a subversion of the the perfect print that that was going on in it. Well, there's a couple of questions in there about uh, one of its the trading card is like a vernacular form, just like a postcard. Like um, Stephen Shore was making postcards of Amarillo, Texas, in the '70s, and Ed Boucher was uh, making these drugstore 
photos of uh, sunset or of, uh, gas stations for his books. And it's kind of an exploration and opening up to the the popular uses of photography. I guess that was part of you know using the trading card format. But the idea of fun is definitely on the on the front here. It's a it should you know that's what it should be if you're really you know, connected to what you're doing. It is obviously something that you love to do. And, um, you know, I uh, taught my first photo teacher. His name was Ed Sievers. I taught him how to play, play Frisbee. And we would go out to the beach and we would just, you know, throw the Frisbee back and forth. And he literally became so interested in that game. He started playing Frisbee more than he was making photographs in his life. Which uh, uh, It's kind of funny because he told me that... Um, his, my parents should be able to sue him for becoming a, an artist where I wasn't going to make any money. And probably Ed should have sued me for getting out and making, uh, you know, playing Frisbee instead of making photographs and making himself famous. But um, anyway, uh, I've, always, I've always thought that uh, it should be fun and, you, sh you know, it should not be about taking yourself that seriously. Uh, and, you know, hopefully that's what most of my work is about. Do you have parakeets? You know, I was just noticing, I should have probably taken, that's one parakeet. <laughs> I should have taken I, it out. I was checking to see whether or not it was, I was like, oh my God, do I have something going on? <laughs> that's fine, you're the guest. We, we yeah. want to hear your parakeets. Donna, I keep going to through Anne, the Her dog's always running around. It's like the highlight of my conversation. Yeah. Well, you know, he only gets really excited when I'm talking. You know, he's just doing nothing most of the time, but when I'm talking, it becomes a, it sounds like a whole crowd. Well, uh, what are people thinking? You know, we have a special guest here. We got a, a chatty group of people here. Uh, we could have people, should we, you know, you want to go through the chat window? What's, what's going on, folks? There's nothing in there or my, my screen is, <laughs> you know, is dead, so. Uh, you know, when you hear someone talk, there's always, there's a, it's well, I'll just I'll throw something else out there if you want, okay? because yeah. before I did the baseball cards, I uh, oh, those, that's great, Susan. I appreciate that. <laughs> um. Oh yeah. But I mean, before you I did the, you the cards, I had another hard. project that uh, was my first attempt at making fun of photography. Was the uh, the seven never before published portraits of Edward Weston, which I don't know if any of you have seen, but that's a little book, and basically it was a mail art project where I found 35 people named Edward Weston. Oh, fantastic. I had to go to the library to go to all the phone books. You know, this is, this is the 70s, right? So there's no internet to find people. You have to go to the, the phone books to find their names. So I found 35 people named Edward Weston. I sent them all a questionnaire at, you know, asking to fill in their hobbies and their special interests. And can they describe a picture that they took? And could they send me a picture of themselves? And I set the thing out three times and I got a total of seven responses. So that became the seven never before published portraits. And actually it was a much more interesting project than I thought it was gonna be. I was, gonna, I was making fun of you know, the fact that we knew too much about Edward Weston because he, in his day books, he would tell us about all the women he was having sex with. And you know, I didn't really need to know that information. <laughs> and I thought I would make fun of Edward Weston even though I loved his photographs. But what I found out was that all these different Edward Westons were sending me portraits of themselves and then adding little bits of information. Like one said, um, you know, he answered all like my questions. He sent a picture of himself. He said, I have a son. His name is also Edward Weston. I'm sorry, I don't have his address. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's, that's quite a vulnerable Pretty moment deep. to you know, me to recognize that he doesn't even have the address of his son. Or there was another uh, Edward Weston who wrote a long letter back instead of filling out the questionnaire. And he said he's been talked about because of his name, uh, the likeness to the great Edward Weston photographer. It was only recently he was invited to attend a show and assist in the judging. <laughs> Just because he was, a, you know, his name was Edward Weston. Was, actually, I think that's a perfect idea is to get Edward Weston to judge a photo show, <laughs> even if he wasn't, had nothing to do with it. Anyway, if you ever have a chance to look at that, it's, Every one of the Edward Westons is completely different, different genres of photography. Some are advertising photos, some are like uh, photos where you would go and have your portrait made for your graduation. Yeah. Uh, pictures of you know somebody in a TV tray, TV table. They're just, a, it was really kind of a, a wonderful chance uh, situation that had absolutely nothing to do with my intention. It didn't really make fun of Edward Weston, the photographer. 
it was just all these people kind of opening up in very unexpected ways. So uh, that, anyway, I just thought I would throw that in. That was my first attempt. It's, that's interesting too. I just have to say, incidentally, my son plays on a soccer team and there's a dad on the team whose name is Gerhard Richter. <laughs> and he knew who he was. But that idea of the combination of reverence, but also um, poking fun at, you know, that, 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 that started, it seems like it started both of, these, both of these projects and a lot of where you start from, I mean, I think, you know, some of the work that, that you did with Larry too, also started from this, this point of both, both uh, yeah, both reverence and subversion. And I, I, I'm, I think that's really interesting that that Weston um, story or project fits really well into that. And then that you made discoveries from there too. I think that that's, that comes back to the road trip idea too, this idea of going somewhere that you don't know what you're going to discover exactly, and then being sure. open to what you, what happens. Yeah, well, I think that's what we do, right? When we're on a project, we, we hopefully we don't know the answer because that's why we're making the work to uh, figure right. it all out. Right. Yeah, it's kind of a it's a kind of uh, like artistic listening, right? Like you might think you know what the thing is, and it turns out that like the the people named Edward Weston's are are more interesting. And the, the original question, which was, oh, I'm going to make fun of this. Suddenly you've got this, you know, collection of people like this accidental set of audience, you know, accidental audience and accidental participants who, who really don't care what you think about Edward Weston, but they do, uh, you know, they have their own, you know, they have their own lives that they reveal to you. So that's, yeah, that's beautiful. We have a, we have, you have a question. Um, and I think it's actually um, well-timed considering where we've just gone in terms of um, the unknown as opposed to perhaps in today's day and age having so many known um, components. But the question uh, is, um, uh, would you consider doing this today with the photographers in uh, today's culture that are the art stars? And would you include social media photographers? Uh, would I do it? <laughs> I guess the question is, you know, could it be done? I don't see why it couldn't be done. But I, I think for me, it was really about, you know, when I showed you that Newsweek article, it was like, that was the year, that, or that was the moment when everything was changing, when photography was really turning into something much more uh, powerful as a uh, phenomenon. So, I mean, I wouldn't be interested in doing it now because that's not, you know, photography is in a different place now. So it's not so... Uh, so, you know, uh, newsworthy or, or uh, on the front of my mind to think of doing something like that. But what, you know, the fact that you guys are doing this, I think is so great because it's a, it's a I think the pictures are really interesting. Some of them are really funny. Uh, there's a back to the card where they can, I think the, the backs could be used a little bit more effectively than what you've got going right now. But uh, sure. just the fact that you acknowledge that there's a back is a good idea. Um, We're going to have you write for every single one of them. Right? <laughs> well, they'll be very it's relevant. Really, really <laughs> interesting. <laughs> the, the, the Ann Tucker comment too, though, is pretty interesting, where she talks about the the, the relationship between the image and knowing which is which is important. The image, the the, the perception that what she wrote about um, some of the people knew that the what they wrote was more important than the picture, um, which is really interesting. It's an interesting conversation there, the, the both, the front and the back, I think. Well, just the fact that they even did it, you know, of course, at the time that I visited them, who would know that I even would do anything that <laughs> would actually work out to become a, a published work. But uh, the fact that all out the back and did try to figure out something that they thought was appropriate in one way or another, whether they were trying to be funny or inadvertently were funny. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was just great. There are a few of them where there's nothing on the back. And sometimes I, I use the card because I really had to have that particular person in the series because it was an important, like Manuel Bravo. It's like he didn't fill out the back of his card. Well, am I going to throw him out because he didn't do it? But um, there were a few people that I didn't include who just didn't fill out the back. In fact, one of my good friends here in Boston is Bill Burke. Yeah. I photographed him for the project. He didn't fill out the back. He didn't fill out the questionnaire, and I threw him out. He threw him out. <laughs> and now he never lets me forget it. So uh, nothing you could do. 
And have you been in contact with a lot of the, I mean, how, how many, how many people who you photographed are still like working as artists and, and out and about and do you have reunions? I mean, when is the, when, <laughs> when is the card reunion happening? You guys should have a big picnic when COVID's over. Well, uh, I guess along those lines, uh, one, uh, friend who I don't get to see that often, but who I did photograph for the project. Uh, I saw him recently, he said, now the project is kind of like the last one standing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, you know, there probably are more dead people on that project now than there are live people. Uh, and you know, that's just the way it is. It's been 40, it's been what, 1975. So that's 45, 45 years. Yeah, 45 years. That's not that long ago. Yeah, but as soon as, I mean, it brings up all sorts of ideas about photography. And as soon as you photograph and you make a stack of pictures of, of people and then time goes by, it does become, I mean, this is my own personal obsession with cards, but that idea of it, it starts to become a pile of people who are here and people who aren't here anymore. I think it's, a, it's, it's an interesting manifestation of what, what one of the things photography does, um, marking time. And you have like a, a stack of cards that marked a moment of time. And now we look at it in 2020. And I mean, I do look at that, you know, the collection and think about who's here and who's not here. It's kind of an interesting, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. Awesome. Well, um, now, one, one last question I was thinking, is, was Imogen Cunningham the first person you photographed or? Yeah. It was. Yeah, yeah. So that was, that was strategic. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have a, you know, the, there's a, the center for the book is also at Iowa. I teach at VCU now, but, and, and there, like, there's a, there's a person I, I, I went to school with there that anytime anybody says anything, they say, make a model. Like, make a model, make it work, make an iteration of it. And if it works, then, like, come and talk to me. And it seems like, you know, if you can get Imogen Cunningham to do it, then you can get Ansel Adams. So I guess I should say that, uh, so I made like a big photograph of Imogen and then I made photographs of people in the Bay Area like Jack Wilpot and Judy Dater and Linda yeah. Connor. And then I was, you know, I came out of LA. So I went down and photographed Robert Heineken and John Devola, who was actually a, he was a student with me. I mean, we were both in the same photo class together. Yeah. Um, but of people in LA, so I had like my LA people and my San Francisco people. And so I made mock-ups. I made little two and a half by three and a half inch uh, photographs and put them, you know, mounted them on cardboard and did my little transfer lettering, my letter set lettering to put the names onto the front of the cards. And so then when I went to visit somebody, I could say, well, here's, here's what they hopefully will look like, or here's who I've already photographed. And that would, that would kind of, you know, enable me to kind of break the ice or have a little conversation about somebody that uh, they recognize. Uh, so when you say to make a model, that's kind of how I enable myself to, uh, to have an entree to the next, next person I was going to meet that I didn't know. There's a question here that follows on from that. Um, did you, did you give, a, give a set of cards to the, peop to the participants? How did you? Oh yeah. You, I mean, yeah. Oh, no, no, I didn't give a set of cards. No, a, you I gave, gave a card. I gave like, I think, uh, 10 cards of each person who was in the set. I gave them those cards, but I didn't give them the full set. Remember, the full set, it wasn't about uh, enabling people to have a full set. You, you had actually to work to get a full set. You yeah. had to trade. It like, like baseball cards. <laughs> you had, there were these trading card parties that uh, museums would set up in like San Francisco Museum in the... Uh, there was a gallery, I think, in Boston that did it, uh, L.A. I mean, there was all these different trading card parties that were set up for people to do just that and to get a full set. But that was part of the idea was that you couldn't easily get the set. Uh, of course, now that it's over, you know, now people buy the full set. I, I've got a bunch of full sets. And instead of being these little uh, worthless pieces of cardboard, now they're actually valuable. So... It's kind of like flipping it over on the opposite side. I was trying to make fun of photography for being right. taken seriously and being turned into a valuable commodity. And you know, now that I'm 45 years older, I don't mind taking advantage of that myself. <laughs> All right, well, uh, any last question? We, we kind of got to wrap up for and prepare a little bit for next week and, and talk about what we're gonna be doing. Is that right, Anne? 
Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. So, Mike, thank you so much for for joining us today. And then also, like, I mean, I think I think we had this idea, and 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 put it out to you through uh, through Becky, and and we received uh, yes, of course, uh, within a couple of minutes, I think. Right. I remember it was like, oh, let, could we do this thing? Oh, we could do this thing. So I want to thank you for being so generous uh, and being involved and, you know, and being a reviewer. Because, you know, the, for our first yes as a reviewer was you. All right. Well, I, don't, I think it'll be a lot of fun to do that. As far as, you know, you guys taking off on the baseball cards, I feel more uh, honored than anything. I don't own it. <laughs> no, 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 of course. Yeah. Get me to say we, don't, we don't either, you know. <laughs> so. well, Anyway, I wish you guys, John, it's been nice meeting you. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. And uh, it's nice to get to see your faces and uh, uh, good luck with this. And I'll, I'll be involved with it as we go. Right. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Mike. Bye. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Right. So we're going to take a few minutes to prep you guys for next week's meeting. For those of you who are able to join us. John, you want to take it away or Betsy? Oh. Oh, put you guys on on the spot. So um, next week, <laughs> next week we are going to um, have a bit of an open forum. Um, we recognize that there is a lot of content um, that the next couple of months um, are going to drive. That uh, we felt like maybe it would be a good opportunity for us all to group, regroup, and and really be a hive mind for each other. Um, and uh, then Photofika is actually going to take a bit of a, um, a break um, so that we can um, regroup and get our, our semesters behind us and our summers in front of us. But we really felt like next week should be an opportunity for us all to um, help strategize for each other um, what the fall might look like and, and the kinds of resources that so many of us as educators are going to need in um, what feels like a great deal of uncertainty. Yeah, and so, um, you know, we're going to try and invite as many people who have been guests to come back, uh, just to come as, as, as visitors again, not, not as a program, but uh, just to have as many people on hand as possible so that we can have some conversations. And, and we, may, we may do some breakout rooms uh, just to, to, to do a little bit of work with each other. Um, and then, and then one of the things that we're talking about is, is and, and Betsy can address this, but Betsy's been really wanting to share some of her expertise around, um, around online teaching and hybrid teaching uh, over the summer via a few workshops uh, that, that they haven't been determined in terms of when and where and how. But, uh, you know, one of the things, like, like, like I've said multiple times on this, uh, broadcast or whatever this thing is, is that, you know, this, this whole thing came about because of Betsy's generosity with her and, and knowledge uh, just on Facebook when all of this started. So, um, you know, she's really committed to trying to help us move forward during, you know, there's a lot of decisions that are going to have to be made and, and a lot of changes that we're going to continue to have to adapt to. And there's a lot of unknowns. I mean, my school wants to open in person they say they're going to open in person. Who knows what's going to happen? But I certainly am preparing for for lots of options. So I'll, I'll let Betsy close the thing out. Yeah, because you can see me opening my mouth ready. No, but I just to follow on. I mean, I, I feel really strongly. The more I'm seeing, I'm like ripping on the New York Times right now. But there, there's a lot of fear mongering right now, and of course, there's a lot there's a lot to be afraid of. But I also think um, I'm really committed. I, we're all really committed to kind of helping, you know, photo education and higher education and really trying to bring out the best. And, and, and uh, I mean, I guess that's what I want to say is that, that the agenda for, for this is really going to be helping people position themselves in the best place for themselves, for their students, but for the whole idea of, of kind of um, standing up for, for what I think is really important is, you know, accessible, um, open-ended, creative higher education. And I feel like it's a, it's something that, that, um, you know, there's a lot of pot potential for change, good and bad happening right now. And I think being aware and being connected, and I, I use this word solidarity, but I really feel like the more we can connect and exchange ideas with each other and, 
and help mitigate the fear and make, make our choices based on moving forward without knowing um, and, and helping each other. I, I, I'm, I feel really, you know, each week I feel that even more strongly. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's definitely where we're going to start from for the summer. The actually, actual details we're going we're gonna to work out as we go. We're going to go forward without knowing exactly. And don't forget to tell your students and anybody you know and anybody that has connection to students and any students of students that yes. are graduating in 2020 to submit because we would yeah. like, we, you know, I have a goal. I don't know how many. Let's say we should at least have 500 cards, don't you I think? I loved 500. 500. 500. The deadline isn't even amazing. close. The deadline's going to be yeah. the 31st. So who, who submits before the deadline? I never, ha I never have. Seven days for yeah. us. Yeah, so seven get days. It. Get people to submit. 250 more cards. Yeah. So, and Tell your got... friends and colleagues who aren't here. <laughs> yes. And let's, get, uh, let's see if we can get some more, uh, yeah people from all over. We've got a great crew of, 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 of schools, uh, you know, some schools I had not been familiar with who submitted a lot of work and, and from obviously more familiar work. So it's, been, it's, it's gonna be a great, great uh, collection of work. Someone from New Zealand. Oh, yeah, no, couple, we couple from New Zealand. Yeah. Susan, yeah. Wants to, Susan Evan wants to know if yeah. anyone's won the coffee yet. Oh yeah, it's a, has, has anyone won the coffee? <laughs> Uh, there certainly are schools that have 10. My school is one of them, and I can make myself coffee anytime. So uh, anyone who has 10, I think I'll go through the list, and I will start mailing out coffee. But I got to figure out who to mail it to if you've got multiple people. So Susan, if you want coffee, I'll send you coffee. You are has more than 10, but you already sent me coffee. So. See? See, and that's already out of the way. So yeah. if you can make a case that you've sent 10 or more students in some way, shape, or form by banding together, I'll send you coffee. Uh, you can find me on the Instagram and all those places on the, on the interweb. So uh, I'm happy to send coffee. That coffee, I know Betsy's gonna be like, this is not a commercial, but that coffee <laughs> now is commercially available through the, my roaster and, and the proceeds of it benefit young people that are in recovery from substance use disorders. So I'll send you coffee for free, but like any good dealer, the first one's free and then you got to pay. Uh, <laughs> perfect. Um, Dana, yes, December 2020 graduates are included in it. We did not um, close it down to just May graduates. So um, absolutely send them our way. 2020, make it happen. Make, make it happen, right? They're awesome. All right. All right. Well, All right. I think we've uh, been in exactly one hour. Thanks. Uh, right. Thanks everyone for coming thanks, everyone. and being here. Uh, good to see everybody. Don't forget to see Dave Johnson's things tonight at Photo Fest. That sounds awesome. Any other big announcements? Can we search by school on the? No, it's it's just at random. What else? Uh, yeah. Oh, someone said this was awesome. We say awesome. I don't know if you've been on, on, on the Facebook page or, not, or the Instagram page. Everyone who sends us a story on Instagram gets awesomed. So, uh, John's making me do it. I know. No, Anne has to do it. She's like, but it's ugly and you're obscuring their images. No and problem the with awesome. I sent I you the whole song about awesome. You know, there's a great song. Awesome. There's a great awesome song called Awesome that uh, I think we'll play. We'll probably start. We'll start next, next uh, week with awesome. Start next week with awesome. All right. Thank That's you guys for being awesome. here. See you next week. Bye, Ron.